So far we've covered ways to pre-process our raw text and then vectorize it so we can calculate some form of similarity between documents. And there'll be more to learn about tokenization and vectorization when we explore deep learning in NLP. But we have enough now to perform common NLP tasks using classical techniques. However, there is one more thing I want to go over before we get to that. And that's an overview of the modeling process in machine learning or ML. Now, this isn't a general ML course and there won't be an exhaustive treatment on modeling, but we'll cover enough of the terminology and concepts to make sure we're on the same page. If you're new to this, there's going to be a lot of terminology in this video. The important thing is to get an idea of the high level modeling flow because we are going to cover the details most relevant to NLP throughout this course as needed. And things will get clearer because we'll use this same methodology in our demos. I also encourage you to look at the additional resources links to get a better idea of each individual concept. If you're already familiar with modeling concepts such as bias and variance, hyperparameters, overfitting and underfitting and how to deal with them, then you can just skip to the next module. All right, so say we're in a situation with some data and a problem where a straight programming approach won't work. Maybe the problem and data are complex enough that we can't possibly write all the rules required to deal with it. Image and speech classification are good examples. Perhaps the environment is fluctuating and our solution needs to automatically adapt to it over time. Think of adversarial situations where our problem is to detect and stop fraud and the fraudsters are frequently changing their tactics to get past our system. Or maybe our problem involves making sense of a large amount of data with no clear view of any relationships within it. For example, we may have a stack of legal documents and we need to discover what issues they cover. So we bring in machine learning. What is machine learning ultimately? It's solving a problem by taking a data set, algorithmically building a statistical model from that data set, and then using that model to solve the actual problem we're interested in. I emphasize algorithmically because in this regard, ML can be viewed as a type of automatic programming, and we'll clarify this further in a moment. For now, let's look at the different types of ML. ML is often categorized into four buckets. There's supervised learning. This is where we start with the labeled data set of examples. So not only does our data set contain the examples or observations, each example is accompanied by a label specifying the ideal answer our model should give for it. The goal then is to feed these labeled examples to a learning algorithm and produce a model which best maps these examples to their respective labels. For classification tasks, these labels would be from a finite set of classes. So for spam detection, our examples could be emails, and each email would have a label specifying whether it's spam. So in the example shown here, we have a data set of four emails with half being spam. For regression tasks, these labels would be real numbers. For something like predicting the prices of used cars, our examples could be car attributes such as brand, model, and manufacturing year. And each example would be accompanied by a price label. Once your model is trained, it's then used on unseen and unlabeled examples and hopefully gives good predictions. And we'll clarify what we mean by good later on. Another type of learning is unsupervised learning, where the data set is a collection of unlabeled examples. Often the goal here is to cluster the data based on shared attributes the learning algorithm discovers, or detect outliers or combine features through dimensionality reduction. We'll encounter unsupervised learning when we discuss topic modeling. There's also something closely related called self-supervised learning, which is powerful, and we'll encounter that in part two. There's semi-supervised learning, where the dataset contains both labeled and unlabeled examples, and we could encounter this scenario because labeling a dataset may be infeasible due to size or expense. The learning algorithm in this case could do something like see what the labeled examples are and assume that unlabeled examples with similar features share the same label. And there's reinforcement learning. This is where our learning algorithm, called an agent, lives in some kind of environment and perceives its environment as a set of features. It then performs actions in this environment, which results in rewards or penalties and can change the environment itself. Through this, it learns a strategy called a policy, which maximizes rewards over time. Creating game playing bots is a classic example. Let's go back to what we said about ML as automatic programming and clarify that in the context of supervised learning. Going back to the classic example of spam detection, our practical problem is to detect whether a given email is spam. Our data set is a collection of historical emails, each tagged with a label specifying whether it's spam. And we create feature vectors from the emails, maybe using the techniques we've discussed so far. We want to take this data and generate a statistical model which can tell us with acceptable probability whether a given email is spam. To do this, we use a learning algorithm, and for a classification task, there are plenty to choose from. We'll be covering one of them very soon. 
we take this learning algorithm and run it over the data. The learning algorithm then outputs a model. This model is just a collection of procedures, data structures, and numbers. The contents differ depending on the learning algorithm. So if our learning algorithm is logistic regression, then the resulting model would consist of a vector of coefficients, the classes to be predicted, and a procedure on what to do with input to make a prediction. With a neural network, the model would consist of weights in a graph structure. This generated model can also be saved and reloaded elsewhere, and it's this model that we care about. We then feed this model new emails, and hopefully it tells us reliably whether it's spam. So essentially what we've done is used an algorithm to consume some data and automatically generate a program to help us solve the problem we're interested in. Just a side note, in practice, people use the terms learning algorithm and model interchangeably, but keep this distinction in mind. Now there's one thing we glossed over. How do we tell if the model's any good? We need to evaluate it, and we need to measure how well our model is doing. To do this, we need to choose some kind of evaluation metric. I know I'm at risk of repeating myself here about the modeling process, but we'll go deeper this time. When we start out, especially with supervised learning, typically what we'll do prior to training is split the data into three sets, train, validation, and test. The validation and test sets are called holdout sets, and we set them aside for now. We don't want our learning algorithm to see them during training. In this example, we've split the data 60-20-20, which is traditional, but can change if we have a large data set. If our data set contains 100 million examples, we won't need 40 million validation and test examples. Even 1% of each is plenty. Conversely, if we have a small data set, we may not have a separate validation set at all. Once we've split our data and have our features ready, we feed only the training set into our chosen learning algorithm. If it's a supervised learning task, then the algorithm will try to find a function which best maps the feature vectors to their respective labels. In that regard, we can view this step as an optimization problem. For example, in linear regression where we're trying to find a relationship between features and a real number, the learning algorithm will try to find optimal values for the coefficients. In this example where we have only a single feature, the algorithm tries to fit a function h of x by finding theta zero for the y-intercept and theta one for the single feature x. These coefficients affect the y-intercept and slope of the line until the one is found that best fits all the data points. And typically in linear regression, ideal coefficient values are found using either a technique called ordinary least squares, or if you have a large data set of many features, an iterative method like gradient descent, which we'll cover when we talk about neural networks. Regardless of the technique, the algorithm is trying to find coefficient values which minimize the difference between its predictions in the column hx and the actual labels themselves. This difference is referred to as the error or loss, and it tries to do this without over-optimizing. Once it's found the best set of coefficients it can, it outputs a model. As mentioned earlier, the contents in the model differ based on the learning algorithm. For linear regression, that would be a set of coefficients and a procedure to multiply each feature with its corresponding coefficient and sum them. All right, so once a model is generated, we need to know whether it's good enough. The first step is to pick an evaluation metric, and like learning algorithms, there's plenty to choose from. Don't worry about what these are for now because we'll cover a few of them as we progress. And like the way we choose our learning algorithm, the evaluation metric we choose is driven by our goals and our data. So what are we trying to do? Is it classification, regression, learning a policy? Is our data balanced or imbalanced, labeled or unlabeled? Let's say we're doing classification and we choose accuracy for our metric. This metric has major downsides, but let's go with this for now because it's easy to understand. Accuracy is exactly what it sounds like. It's the percentage of times our model was correct. More formally, it's the number of true positives plus true negatives divided by the total number of predictions made, which includes the true positives, true negatives, false positives, and false negatives. So if we have a spam classifier, it's the number of correctly classified emails divided by the total number of emails classified. So the first thing we want to see is the model's accuracy on the training set. What was the best it could do there? And let's say it's 55%. In other words, it was wrong 45% of the time. This error rate in training is called the model's bias. Informally, when we see a model with high bias, we say it's underfitting the data. That is, it's doing a poor job finding relationships between the features and the labels. At this point, we need to take a step back and deal with it. There are a few common causes for underfitting. One is that the model is too simple. For example, we may be trying to find a linear relationship between the chances of a marriage lasting 10 years and various features such as education levels, number of children, country, etc. 
Maybe there isn't a linear relationship there. In cases like this, one thing to try is a more powerful algorithm. So for our example, perhaps some form of decision tree is more appropriate. Another cause of underfitting is poor features. For example, maybe we're predicting how high someone would score their own life satisfaction from 0 to 10, but the only feature we have is the car they drive. Chances are that won't lead anywhere. In this case, we need to find better data or extract more informative features from the data we have. Okay, let's say we do one or both these things, and we go back to look at our accuracy on the training set again. This time we end up with an accuracy of 90%, which, depending on our situation, may be great. The model now has low bias. The next thing we do is run our model on the validation set, and remember the model's never seen the examples in the validation set before. And we end up with 60% accuracy on the validation set. That's a big drop. In this case, though the model has low bias, it has high variance. Informally, we say the model is overfitting the data this time. It's over-optimized on the training set and failed to generalize to the validation set. So once again, we need to step back and deal with it. There are a few common causes for overfitting. One is that this time, the model is too complex for the data. For example, our regression model might have a high degree of polynomials such that we have this curving line that perfectly fits all our training data. The problem here is that as soon as we try to predict some unseen data represented by this black dot here, the prediction is going to be way off. And one way to counter this is to choose a simpler model. This could mean cutting down on the number of parameters or using a different algorithm entirely. Another way overfitting can occur is we may have too many features and a small number of training examples. When we have irrelevant features or a lot of features relative to our training dataset size, our model can come to unwarranted conclusions. Our model may stumble onto a feature that it thinks explains a label, but really is just a coincidence in the dataset. For example, finding a spurious relationship between a team's chance of winning a game and the color of the bus they ride in. And the solution for that is to either reduce the number of features or get more training data. Finally, we can also fight overfitting by constraining the model through regularization. Regularization is any technique that forces a learning algorithm to build a less complex model and hopefully prevent overfitting. There are a variety of regularization techniques depending on the learning algorithm. L1 and L2 regularization are common in both classical models and neural networks. With decision trees, we can control the maximum height of the tree generated. There are also neural network specific techniques such as dropout, and we'll cover a subset of them in this course. The important thing to know for now is that they exist, and there's a trade-off involved in using them. Often, adding regularization will increase our model's bias, but also reduce its variance. That is, the model won't do as well in training, but it will generalize better when used on the validation and test sets. Regularization is controlled by hyperparameters, which we'll encounter as well. Consider them tunable settings on the learning algorithm. The important thing here is that they're not part of the model, but part of the learning algorithm itself. And while some algorithms can optimize hyperparameters for us, we also have the option to set the values manually. All right, so after seeing our model is overfitting, we go back and maybe get more data, reduce features, or add regularization and tune our hyperparameters. Perhaps we even train multiple models and run each one on our validation set. And our best performing model on the validation set looks like this. If this is acceptable for our goals, we move on to the last step. For our last step, we can retrain the winning model on both the training and validation set using the best hyperparameter values we could find. And then finally test the model on the test set, which the winning model has never seen up to this point. If the metrics there are still acceptable and the model meets our other requirements, which we'll get to in a moment, we save our model to disk and put it into production. Maybe we put it behind a web API or run batches of data through the model overnight to generate predictions for use the next day. We also monitor and update the model as needed. I just mentioned the model having to meet other requirements before being selected. Beyond how well it performs given some evaluation metric, there may be a bunch of practical concerns as well. Performance requirements. Does the model need to work in a low latency environment and return predictions quickly? If the model is highly accurate, but takes too long to respond, then it may be infeasible. Does the model need to work in a hardware constrained environment? Our model may be fast and accurate, but have a large footprint or demand a lot of power. If we need to put our model on a mobile device with no network capability, then maybe the model can't be deployed. Data and storage requirements. Does the model require a ton of data that we don't have or can't afford? Beyond just having the data, perhaps we don't have the governance or expertise required to manage it. Interpretability requirements. Does every prediction made by the model need to be explainable? If there's a legal requirement to explain why the model made a particular decision, could we do it or is the model opaque in a complete black box? 
training time? Do we have the time and budget to train this model? Perhaps we need to fall back to a simpler model that can be trained in a fraction of the time, but gives results almost as good. An impact of error. What is the cost of a model error, and is it acceptable? If the cost is someone experiencing a minor inconvenience once in a while, maybe that's okay. If the cost is someone being killed, maybe it's not. These are a bunch of practical concerns beyond evaluation metrics, and it's important to keep them in mind. Okay, so that's the modeling process at a high level. We briefly went over the different types of ML, splitting data into train, validation, and test sets, what it means to have high and low bias and variance, how overfitting and underfitting can occur and how to deal with them, and we were introduced to the concepts of regularization and hyperparameters, and we looked at practical concerns beyond evaluation metrics. Now again, depending on your level of familiarity with the subject, that may have just been a refresher or a lot to take in. We also didn't cover things like initial data exploration, but the important thing right now is to have a general sense of the flow. We'll put all this into practice when we demo individual models, evaluation metrics, and regularization techniques throughout the courses needed. For now, I encourage you to look at the additional resources links, and I'll see you in the next video, where we'll start putting everything we've discussed so far into practice.